Good morning, good afternoon even. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome, welcome today to our webinar, How to Develop a Neuroinclusion Policy. Um, if you are just coming in, um, please let us know where you're joining us from today. Um, and crucially, why? Why are you here? What made you sign up for the webinar? I'm Dr. Deborah Leveroy. I'm the Head of Consultancy and Research here at Neurobox. For those of you that don't know us, we're a workplace adjustment provider dedicated to fostering inclusive and accessible work environments for disabled and neurodiverse individuals. I'm really excited to be with you here today and share some insights on how to develop a neuroinclusive policy. Now, this webinar was developed out of material from our strategy and policy development workshop that we run with our clients. A little bit of housekeeping for you. Uh, captions are available at the bottom of the screen. You just need to enable them by clicking on captions and that is next to the record button. The session is recorded and you will get a copy of the recording after the event. Please use the uh, Q&A function for any questions. Um, and that Q&A function, I'm pleased to say, is um, manned by my colleague, Bronwyn Francis, who is our people and culture manager. Um, so they are in the chat with you and they'll be answering your questions. Please use the chat function to share your experience, any best practice, any challenges. So an overview of our time here together. We're going to start with why. Why are you here? Why does it matter? Why do you need a neuroinclusive policy? Just reading the chat. Sorry, just reading the Q&A. OK, um, what are your goals? What is the purpose of the policy? So essentially, what do you want to achieve? And who is involved in this policy development process? What do you need in order to develop the policy? So time, people, information, expertise. And what does a policy look like? So what should it include, essentially? So I want to kick off by exploring what is a neuroinclusion policy. It's a relatively recent concept. There are some examples that I'll be um, referencing throughout our time together from the British Red Cross, uh, the GMB Union and also the Borough of Broxbourne. But what would be great is if you type in the chat function, one word, one sentence, it could be a, an emoji or an, or an image, what comes to mind when you think neuroinclusion policy? Um, it might be that you think, ah, in which case, please find an emoji to represent those feelings, um, confusion, um, you know, whatever, whatever's kind of coming up for you guys, I'd be really interested to hear um, what your thoughts are. Distinct. Yeah, it is a very distinct um, policy, potentially. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. I know you put something in the question and answer. Um, CEO of a small charity, you'd like to develop a specific neuroinclusion policy rather than it being referenced in other policies. That is a really good point and we'll, we'll touch on that uh, throughout our time together. Lovely. Okay, so um, let's start with why. Um, I am going to quote um, Simon Sinek, who talks about how people don't buy what you do, but they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. So that why is really, really crucial. It kind of drives everything that we're going to be talking about. And it's why, essentially, I want to start with the why. Um, thank, thank you, Iona. You said uh, making the workplace work for everyone. Thanks for that. Um, so there are different whys and they will vary, of course, across different organizations, different individuals, um, and there are many whys. And I just wanted to reflect the diversity of those whys uh, in this slide. So what I'd like you to do is just really think about, you're very welcome, obviously, to share any thoughts in, in the chat. Um, what are your motivations for developing a policy? Um, you may have a personal motivation. This may be a lived experience. You may have a child or a relative um, with that experience, and that's kind of sparked your interest in, in, in this area, and you've brought that personal interest into the organisation. 
Um, your organization may have identified this as something that they really want to uh, want to explore and want to do. Now, whether that's from a social justice angle, whether it's because an organization potentially sees the business benefit, the business case um, for neuro inclusion, whether it's from more of a compliance point of view, we need to do this in order to ensure legality. Maybe it's from a numbers perspective. You are seeing a growing number of individuals coming and requesting adjustments and you don't have um, a policy in place. You may be experiencing um, employees coming to you. They're unhappy, potentially disengaged, underperforming. And so either you're experiencing that or obviously you don't want to experiencing that, experience that. So you're kind of coming to nip that in the bud by putting a policy in place first. I'm sure it, you know, it happens that you have um, situations where you've got managers that are confused, that don't know what to do, that, that don't have the support in order to, um, to support individuals effectively and appropriately. You may have existing policies, as Vicky mentioned. So you may have, for example, a disability policy. You may have a workplace adjustment policy. You may have an ED&I policy. Um, but you're looking at something quite distinctive, but that also aligns with, of course, the suite of policies that you already have. And crucially, you hopefully, or this will start to get you thinking about developing actually a strategy, because of course we can talk about policy, but it, it's really crucial, obviously, that we tie it with your overall strategy. So you may have an existing strategy in place and you are looking to develop a policy to kind of, if you like, enact the strategy or codify it. Um, or actually, maybe this is the start of developing a strategy and out of that comes your policy. Some of the questions that I'm going to be exploring with you are strategic questions. So you could use those to, to get you thinking about your strategy. So once you've got your why clear, um, you might want to think about how you use that why in your vision statement. And this is a vision statement that obviously can appear in your policy and across other uh, communications. Um, and just to share this one that I have from the United Lincolnshire Hospitals NHS Trust. So our vision is for equality, diversity and inclusion to be a golden thread running through and central to how we work together to provide sustainable, high quality, patient centred care for all people living in Lincolnshire. That's just to provide an example. So what's really key about this vision statement is that it needs to do a few things. It needs to be really authentic. So it needs to come from a genuine place. And that's why I think if you do that work around the why, that's where the authenticity will come from. But also it needs to be aspirational. So you need to kind of set the tone or this, this kind of vision, if you like, or picture of what you want it to do and to kind of think really big. And also you want it to be persuasive. So you want whoever's reading that policy or the vision statement to really buy into this vision. So you notice that particularly in this uh, statement, you have quite a lot of imagery um, kind of, um, I guess, I uh, can't think of the word, but yeah, you have, you know, a golden thread. You have very kind of emotive words and you know I've read other vision statements and they're much more emotive but you might want to think about using a lot of persuasive language in your vision statement in order to get that buy-in and to create that image of what you want to achieve. So the next step, and again, this is also a, a strategy question alongside policy, is thinking about where you are now. So really taking into account your organization's current position, your capabilities, your resources um, and the other business priorities. So thinking about what's working, and these are just some examples, um, it might be that you have more managers coming forward, which is, of course, a good thing. Um, you might be seeing more general awareness in the organization and goodwill to do something. Um, and you might be seeing some good practice on the ground. But that good practice might not necessarily be, be being shared um, amongst the organization, obviously, depending on how large or small the organization is. Not everyone is kind of hearing about it. So the communication isn't, isn't quite there yet. But these are all, all really good signs that you're on the right path. What's not working? 
So there could be many things that aren't working. And sometimes it's easier to identify the things that aren't working from the things that are working. So it's really important that you do start with the what's working question. So what's not working? It could be that you're getting a lot of questions around what do I do from colleagues and managers? What do I do about X, Y, and Z? Or you could be getting the people actually doing things. So managers trying to support, colleagues trying to support and provide signposting advice, guidance, but they're not being given the support or the training in order to do that effectively and safely. People not really knowing what's available, how to support, a lack of kind of consistent communication about the process. It might be that you don't currently have buy-in um, across the organization as well. So not everyone kind of understands why we need to be thinking about this and doing it. You may not have a consistent process, as was mentioned earlier. You may have different stakeholders, actors involved, IT procurement, but there's no kind of thread running through them. There's no process. purpose of your policy. So what do you want it to effectively do? So I'm going to provide an example here from the British Red Cross. Now, this is actually an example from their disability policy. So um, they have set out the purpose and aims. So the purpose of the policy is to ensure that we operate consistent with our fundamental principles and our inclusive value, as well as to ensure that our practice is compliant with relevant legislation and regulation. So we, here we have, I guess, two sides of the why, one being the idea of um, the, the social justice element, the, the, the inclusion piece, fundamental principles, they mentioned inclusive value, and then we have the sort of compliance legal side as well, mentioning being compliant with relevant legislation and regulation. Okay. So when you're thinking about what you want your policy to do, um, you want to think about your strategy. So where do you want to be? So what does, if you like, success look like for you? What are you kind of aiming for? And I would maybe think about um, this as being very tangible outcomes, if possible, measurable. So something that would happen as proof, if you like, or evidence rather that your neuroinclusion strategy is kind of working or is best practice. And there could be a number of measures that you use to determine that um, and really think kind of think um, at least in this initial kind of mind mapping or sort of brain dumping phase. Think obviously uh, concrete outcomes, but really, you know, think as big as you can. You can always kind of work backwards, but but start start from a, a sort of place of expansion, I'd say. So you want to think about who's going to be involved in the policy development process. So identifying the key stakeholders within your organization. So these may be the employee networks, managers, um, other stakeholders involved in the process of workplace um, adjustments. So that might be um, the IT team, health and safety, however your organization is set up. How will you ensure buy-in? So we mentioned this earlier the importance of that why of getting it right and getting it kind of in a in a nice it, obviously it being a, a coming from an authentic place but also um something that you feel will be you know has a kind of persuasive element to it as well but we know that it's important that you customize the why depending on who you're speaking to so it's really important that you know your audience so the why will be different for, let's say, a manager to someone that is working already in DNI, for example, potentially. And how will you ensure employee involvement and participation? So a number of things maybe to explore. If you have employee networks, they tend to be the individuals who are potentially most engaged in this area because I guess they have more at stake because of that lived experience. You may want to run some focus groups, um, thinking about how you will engage individuals. So what's the process of 
the policy development are you going to develop a policy and then inform people are you going to develop a policy and then consult with the relevant stakeholders are you going to work together with the stakeholders are you going to ask the um, lived experience employees to lead this as well or co-lead so it's uh, I was having a great conversation with my colleague Bronwyn um, yesterday about this, these kind of four different options. And they were saying that, you know, consulting is the kind of is good practice. Working together is best practice, if you like. And the lived experience employees leading is, is you know, exemplary practice, as long as obviously you're able to support those employees so that it's not just another thing for someone to do. So it's not a kind of plus one kind of thing. But yeah, I guess at a, at a minimum, we would kind of think about the process being a consulting one. Um, and we know that, for example, if you're working um, in the public sector, the policy may be contractual. So c consultation is actually part of that process and it, and it kind of has to be done um, alongside with working with a union. If you're not in the public sector, it might be that the, per the policy is more around setting the tone, the culture. Uh, the vibes uh, providing um, a process um, and guidance and signposting, for example. Thinking about what resources you need. So what expertise do you need? People, um, where do you find the people? Are they within your organization? Do you need to bring in external people to support you? Do you have the budget for this? So there's a budget potentially for, of course, developing the policy because that will take time and people to implement that policy in terms of the budget for communicating it and also for the things or the infrastructure you need in order to action the policy. So that might be a training budget, learning and development. Um, how are you going to benchmark it, for example? All of these things will take time and require budget. And lastly, in terms of resources, the governance and the sponsorship. So how are you going to essentially monitor the implementation or the rollout of this policy and also the long term kind of impact, if you like, um, who kind of, I guess, has ownership over that? And also, um, what sponsorship do you have? If you're in a very large organisation, do you have senior leadership sponsorship that can really kind of be the face of the policy and really do a lot of that kind of buy in work by really you know champion, championing this um this cause so what to include in a neuro inclusion policy so um these are just some potential suggestions um i think that it might be a good idea to think about who is the policy for initially so who is it going to be reading it? And so that would, of course, affect the content, but also the tone and style of the policy itself. So some potential components um, would be an introduction, of course, definitions, key legislation, identifying need, the workplace adjustment process, alongside reasonable adjustments, other support systems, performance management and capability, recruitment, progression and promotion, awareness training, monitoring and compliance and responsibilities and signposting. This is just to give you an overview. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about, each, about the elements in a, in a moment. Of course, all these um, components, potential components, aren't all relevant and they are all different for every organisation. The components of a neuro inclusion policy, this introduction that we touched on. So you would want to set out your purpose and your aims, whom it applies to, um, also the scope of the policy um, and the context that this policy comes out of. So the context being potentially other policies in the organization um, and that kind of thing. So what is a neuro inclusion policy? So here's an introduction example from the borough of Broxbourne. So purpose and aims, who it applies to, and also the scope is included in this example. So the aim of the policy is to outline Broxstow's 
Borough Council's commitment to promoting equality and fairness, whilst recognising and celebrating the diversity that exists amongst our local communities. It will also outline the duties we must uphold and the corporate framework within which we operate. This policy applies to workers and potential workers who are neurodivergent or who believe that they may be neurodivergent. It is also a document to give guidance to managers of neurodiverse staff. The scope of this policy covers conditions including, but not limited to, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia and dyscalculia. So as you see, I've highlighted those areas just to give you a sense of the structure of that introduction in terms of setting out the aim, um, who the policy applies to. Crucially, it's those who are neurodivergent or, or believe they may be, um, and that it's about uh, essentially providing guidance to managers. The scope of the policy gives some indication as to what is potentially included um, in this concept of neurodiversity. So components of a neuroinclusion policy continuing. So the next bit is we might want to think about a definitions or a term of reference for the policy. So I guess sometimes um, we come to um, a piece of work with a certain the level of knowledge and, and experience and sometimes I guess we can assume that we all whoever's reading it will have that as well but of course that's not always the case and as a manager if I need some guidance a policy may be one of the first things I go to to, to explore so actually it's good in that policy if we don't assume things like definitions in terms of references so if, if, so for example you may want to include a, a a definition of neurodiversity, of neurotypical disability, reasonable adjustments, for example. Um, and I would, if you are able to, obviously consult with um, employee networks, those with lived experience with those definitions, because of course definitions are constantly changing and evolving. So that's something that I would think about in terms of monitoring your policy, keeping it up to date as well. So obviously ensuring key legislation is highlighted. So essentially, you know, what is the kind of legal underpinning for this policy um, that that is highlighted in there? And also identifying needs. So how are you going to kind of, if you like, identify when individuals need things, essentially? So are you going to be proactive? So do you have a, a kind of a process for asking people if they require adjustments at certain points in the employee life cycle or are you going to be reactive, as in just wait until there's a, let's say, a performance management issue, for example? Um, you may also want to set out your um, stall, if you like, on um, whether your focus is on identifying or um, requiring a diagnosis in order to um, request adjustments or removing barriers. So that is obviously a personal choice of the organisation. We would generally always suggest, as it does in the Equality Act, that, that an organisation focuses much more on removing barriers and putting in place adjustments and not on the diagnosis or requiring a diagnosis in order to uh, request adjustments. But of course, some individuals or managers don't always know that. And so if you make if you make that quite clear in your policy, that really helps uh, to support managers with that. So the workplace adjustment process. So this workplace adjustment process can be complex and involve many different people. So this is probably one of the most important elements potentially of this policy is that you're providing clarity about how it works within your organisation. So what is the process, the, the, the roadmap, if you like? Who do you go to um, if you're a manager or if you're a team member and you require support? Um, are you using, do you have a kind of internal team that sort of manages that? Is it the HR business partner? Sometimes, not often, but it can sit within health and safety, for example. Or do you have a kind of external provider that is providing your workplace needs assessments and adjustments? Are you using access to work, for example? And what state and what time scales do you have, if any, for agreeing to implement adjustments, for example? What stakeholders are involved in this process and at what stage? Do you have, for example, a, a workplace disability passport that, that kind of sits within that workplace adjustment process? 
Next, also really crucial, this concept of reasonable adjustments. What does that mean? So what is reasonable um, depends on the context, but it would be useful if you set out your definition of reasonableness within the context of the policy. How do you determine reasonableness? So this is really important guidance for managers and employers, employees um, to, to have. And then other support. So an employee assistance programme, for example, uh, the access to work mental health support scheme, any employee networks, any mentoring, so any other support um, either within the organisation or potentially outside community groups um, that you would like to signpost um, both to your managers and to your team members. And lastly, performance management and capability proceedings. So this is a, a section taken from the GMB union um, a template policy. It's quite interesting. So I've pulled it out here. So um, as it says, the agreement acknowledges um, that standardized employment practices can hinder neurodivergent workers' performances. So that's quite a you know, a, a bold and true statement, and it's very interesting that it's in there. Um, so it outlines that um, performance management processes should be used to enhance support for neurodivergent workers and remove barriers. So the purpose being is out, is, is is highlighted. If performance issues are linked to a neurodivergent condition, proceedings will be paused until reasonable adjustments are made and have have had time to take effect. That's quite a useful piece of guidance there. Um, one of the questions we do get asked a lot is around this performance management area. And so if you have in a policy, um, you know, that it's quite clear that if you haven't, that you need to put essentially the adjustments in first before you and let them, you know, kind of have time to bed in before you then potentially go towards the uh, capability performance management route. So third bullet points, managers who conduct performance management will receive training on neurodiversity <clears throat> with the training program agreed uh, upon within a year of the agreement. So there is something very clear signposting in there that says that if you're a manager and you conduct performance management, then you need to have this training. And crucially, neurodivergence will not be a reason for initiating performance management. So that's quite nice because it's actually very clear for managers in terms of where, you know, where the lines are, I guess, with that. And then the last three, three elements, four elements you might want to think about is, you know, recruitment, progression and promotion. Obviously, you probably would have a recruitment policy as well. So you'd need to think about how this sits alongside the recruitment policy. Um, what provision is currently available um, within the recruitment process for individuals? What adjustments are available? Um, what kind of essentially proactive steps are you taking to remove dis uh, discriminatory elements? And how are you encouraging candidates or employees, of course, to request adjustments during recruitment, but also, of course, throughout the life cycle? Training. So when are you going to do training? Where? How often? Who's going to fund it? So, for example, will it be will a kind of neurodiversity awareness training be incorporated into existing equality and diversity training programs, um, both kind of initially and a sort of top up training, if you like? Um, how will it be funded? So will it be if it's for an individual as part of an individual's kind of um, adjustment package, if you like, it might be funded by access to work. Or does it come out of a departmental budget, out of more broadly learning and development, for example? So will all managers who conduct performance management or capability proceedings receive neurodiversity training? So, yeah, as we mentioned before, it, that is a question for you guys to, to, to consider and, and explore. So monitoring and compliance. So essentially, who's going to monitor this policy in terms of updates, um, in, but also in terms of the kind of impact of the policy that it's actually being kind of used, of course, on the ground and is being is being applied and, and has some value and is useful. Um, 
And then lastly, responsibilities and signposting resources. So just being clear in the policy, who holds the policy, who's responsible for it. And also lastly, providing signposting resources within that policy for that line manager, um, for that team member, so that they can kind of take the next steps they need out of the policy. So, um, what next question? So these are some questions. Well, they are the questions that I've used to structure the webinar today, but there's some questions for you guys to take away and have to think about in terms of moving forward. So being very clear with your why, as we mentioned, where are you now? So doing a little bit of an audit about your current position, what's working, what's not working. What's the purpose of the policy? What do you want it to do? And linking it with your overall strategy, of course. And how are you going to do it? Who will be involved? And of course, what do you need? And what to include in the policy? So what are the essentially the elements that make up um, the policy itself? So thank you for listening. I can see there's a few um, comments. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free um, to put them in the chat or the Q&A. And as I said, my colleague Bronwyn is also around. So please feel free to, to add any, any questions. Um, yeah, there is a point around, um, yeah, Bronwyn's answered that. Yeah, so yeah, the thing about the diagnosis, we would always recommend, um, you know, not to have any, that there wouldn't be a, um, a a need or a, basically an organization shouldn't request uh, evidence of you know or a diagnosis in order to put in place adjustments um, and that actually the 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 approach that is advocated in the equality act is is of kind of proactive barrier removing and focusing on barriers um, and support rather than a kind of medical model of i need to see your 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 report essentially and um with access to work which is the government funded scheme that supports um em employees um, and organizations um they don't require a formal diagnosis um in order to put in an application to access to work there are some cases where they do require it and that's for very specific circumstances but i'd say in about 90 percent of cases they don't um so um, great, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, the, um, the other thing that we wanted to mention before we wrap up the conversation um, is um, this is a webinar in a series of other webinars and my colleague Jess is going to share a slide, I believe, um, just to give you a taster of what's, um, what's coming up in the next few months. Thank you, Jess. Um, so um, in October, um, we have my colleagues Donna and Mark, they're going to be talking about workplace needs assessments. So workplace needs assessments are something that are a kind of vital and really enabling tool in that workplace needs assessment, but they can also be slightly confusing um, and um, kind of, yeah. So the purpose of, of the talk is basically to untangle or demystify this workplace needs assessment. So talk about what, what essentially, what, what is an assessment, what's involved in it, and also to pull apart a little bit around what you can expect out of it and the purpose as well. So that would be really valuable. And then in November, uh, myself and Donna are going to be talking about how to encourage that conversation around adjustments, um, around support and those kinds of things as well. And then lastly, in December, my colleague Donna is going to be exploring how to champion employee resource groups or employee networks. And we've got some um, some great uh, panel members um, from um, Avenard. Um, joining us uh, to, to explore that. And that will be looking a little bit at, you know, how to set up a group, how to ensure, um, I guess, um, you know, how, how to um, ensure kind of impact over, over lo the long term, what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis, all of those kind of things. Um, so thank you for your comments. Um, just reading them. Um, 
Thank you, Vicky. Um, so Vicky asked, any recommendations where to look at tech options, tips that may support people? I've heard of Otter AI, transcription software, different color text for dyslexic staff, access to work. Yes. Um, so thanks for that, Vicky. What we'll do is we'll, after this session, um, in the next few days, we'll send you a follow-up email and that will include um, some links. Um, we have a lot of information on our website, but we'll point out specific areas, um, particularly around um, assistive technology, um, transcription software, um, which we supply, and also general kind of best practice. And we have some information as well, of course, about access to work and stuff. So we'll, we'll send that out to you. Um, so Leslie said, not needing to provide a diagnosis, something that I'll promote more confidently as I'm asked to seek a diagnosis confirmation before providing support. Yes, yes, that's, that's really good. Um, so it, it's really, um, yeah, it's, it, it's not always talked about, as in sometimes there's an assumption that somebody needs to have a, a diagnosis in order to request, but but they don't. Um, and I guess we would always say to the organisation, um, you know, what's your kind of capacity, if you like, for risk? As in, you can ask someone, you can have a policy that says we need a diagnosis, but then that potentially could put you at odds with the Equality Act. So, and also, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, by Peter, um, you know, obviously the diagnosis waiting list on the NHS is, is 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 very long, and so if we were to wait for a diagnosis before requesting adjustments, they would never happen potentially. Um, so, in so many ways, it makes much more sense to focus on providing adjustments and removing barriers rather than waiting for kind of bits of of paper essentially. Um, great. Um, if anyone else has any questions or comments, um, then please, um, please let us know. Um, otherwise, I'll just check the chat. Um, yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Please do join us again for our future webinars. Um, as I mentioned, you will be getting the recording um, at some point in the next week. Um, in your email box um, alongside with some resources that you might find helpful. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.